he asked again for a wise and an understanding heart that he might be able to judge this so great a people. Solomon did not go to God looking for wealth. I'm trying to help somebody here. Because mammon can become your God. It can consume you to a place where, and I, I shared it recently when I was teaching, recently at home I was teaching a sermon. What was it called? Well, I was talking about how I've read, met rich people who are very poor. Because, yeah, they don't, live on, they don't live with purpose. They don't live with purpose. They have a lot of money. They have more than they will ever need. And it just carries no purpose. It's not translated to touching or changing humanity. It's just adding zero zeros until the day they die. They live poor and die rich. Then their children, who don't even know how to manage that, take over. And in the second or third generation, it's wasted, it's gone. And it's repeated every day. It is believed that about 40% of the richest people on the face of the earth have Jewish connection. I took time to study Jewish philosophy. How do these people think? Why do they have such a discipline around wealth? And I, I realized, ah, they understand the assignment, the divine assignment of why they're building and what they're building for. Are we following what I'm saying? So back to, to Solomon. Solomon says, give me a wise and an understanding heart that I may know how to judge your people. He wasn't looking for wealth. And God says, ah, because you have asked this, you'll read the next verses. He says, one, I have given you wisdom like no man has had on the earth, number one. He says, because you did not ask for riches, Solomon didn't go to God asking for riches. The richest man known in the Bible, in the history of the Bible, did not go to God asking for riches. Understand what I'm saying here. He says, because you did not ask for riches, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 12, and wealth and honor. Sorry, can we go back up a bit up? Uh -huh. God said, because this was in your heart, and thou hast not asked riches, verses 11, wealth or honor, no life for your enemies, neither yet have asked long life. But you have asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, thyself sorry, that thou mayst judge my people, over whom I have made thee king, because you knew what to ask for. Next verse. God said to him, wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee. And, number two, I will give thee riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall any after thee have like that. Who got it? Did Solomon go to God to ask for wealth? Did he go to God to ask for honor? I want people to honor me and put a red carpet when I'm entering. Do you get it? Did he ask for riches? Was he looking for a certain status in, in society? No. He went for purpose and asks for the ultimate. He says, give me wisdom that I will judge these people. Let me be functional in the office of a king as I ought to. And God said, because you have asked for that, I will also give you, ladies and gentlemen, wisdom precedes wealth. Tell your neighbor, wisdom precedes wealth. Now here I'm not talking about worldly or fallen wisdom or forbidden wisdoms of this earth. I'm talking about divine wisdom. It precedes all wealth like we know. That is the wealth that maketh rich, the Bible says, and addeth no sorrow. The wisdom of this world, you have had the stones, the more money and more problems. But this wisdom, this wealth, sorry, it maketh a man rich and it addeth no sorrow. This kind of wealth is generational and it's a covenant wealth because it comes through the wisdom of God. For it is God who, the Bible says, gives us power, to make wealth that he might establish the covenant that he made with our fathers. Their covenants that were made on your behalf through faith. 
that will guarantee a certain advantage and a positioning in this dispensation even before you do anything. And you must connect to that power before you learn these other principles, which are all ultimately important. But they carry, firstly, the foundation of this wisdom. I have seen many people who have gone for wealth without this wisdom, without this foundation and grounding, and I've seen the most desperate, distraught, disturbed, depressed, and some have actually died early. I'm sorry, I'm going to use an example. I read the other day in shock that the late Whitney Houston burnt 100, close to $100 million. It's on record. In drugs. How can a person in one lifetime burn millions of dollars in drugs and related activities? What she had on her life was bigger than what she could contain as an individual because that glory did not come with the wisdom that was necessary to ground her. People in America might not understand this, but when you come from a third world country like I come from, there's a young man who's just $20,000 to death. He's going to get $20,000 tomorrow out of business deal. He's going to go and waste his body. And within the next year, they are going to bury him. The problem was that wealth came without the precedence of wisdom. It doesn't matter how much you'll teach him and how much, many classes he will attend. If he does not carry this bearing, this foundation, the wisdom of God to understand purpose, to know assignment, to align himself as he ought, we are bound to lose such young men. How many young men today have you seen on television who are, you know, showing off six, eight million dollar watches on the same face of the earth where kids are dying? This week we're sending food in northern Uganda. A team went there a few weeks before. They found a kid starving. They, a lady came to carry this child, and this kid started biting the person because they were that hungry. Last year, we sent food in Karamoja because they found a lady dead, cold because of hunger, and her baby was breastfeeding a dead body. You understand? On the same face of the earth where somebody is smashing a golden necklace, of five, six million dollars, showing off the fleet of 100 and 200 cars. There's a human being somewhere who's trying to circle a breast of his dead mother. You know why? Because sometimes we emphasize certain things and lose the wisdom for the purpose of which God has anointed and ordained us to be what we must be. These are the things I pray that through this conference, whatever you go home to make, don't lose the mind of why God has positioned you wherever he has positioned you. I love what Mr. Dimitri said, that I never forget where I come from. Because he knows that there's many people like that and he needs to become that beacon of light to influence and inspire that generation which can also be where I'm at. Are you following what I'm saying? God help me. The room is so quiet, you know. <laughs> I'm getting intimidated. I don't know whether I'm, I'm preaching right or I'm annoying, I'm offending or adding, I don't know. So I studied Solomon. And you see him in three phases of life. You see him write Pro uh, Song of Songs at his youngest age as a young man. When he gets into middle age, he's writing Proverbs. When you see him write in Ecclesiastes, he's writing in his old age, okay? Now, when he's writing in his old age, and I don't want you to lose this, when he's writing in his old age, you see greater wisdom on his head than when he was a middle-aged man, yet he had wisdom. And when he's writing in Proverbs, you see greater wisdom when in his middle age than when he was a young man. But in all of these dispensations or these phases of life, he was a wise man. He carried the wisdom of God. In one of those accounts in Ecclesiastes, I believe it should have been Ecclesiastes 2, if you'll allow me to take us there. I want to open our eyes to something. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He said, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure and behold also, this is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of mirth. No, 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 let me... 
Mm. Okay, let me begin verses three. And I want, us to give, I want us to give us a foundation of this. Solomon, even in his wisdom, there are things he didn't know. Okay? So he started to explore in his own life to know certain things beyond what his wisdom would give him. In verses 3, he says, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their lives. I'm curious. Like, what is, what is the purpose of life? What is, okay, so tomorrow you have a million dollars. Mm -hmm. You have a very posh mansion on the lake somewhere in California. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what more to life is there? Why do people live this life? This is a wise man acquainting himself with wisdom, but without the wisdom of certain realms in life. Because even with the wisdom of God, certain things were short. Now you understand why we introduce messianic wisdom. Because Christ gives us the perfect and complete picture, that which Solomon could not see. So anyway, he goes to take wine. And the scriptures tell us, verses 4, he made him great works, built himself houses, planted vineyards, made gardens and orchards, planted trees in them, all kinds of fruit, made pools of water, God's servants, verses 7, and maiden servants, born in his house, great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before him. Verses 8, I gathered silver and gold, the peculiar treasures of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments, and all of, all of that sort. So as great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, he said, my wisdom was before me, but I was seeking for something. And he says, and whatsoever my eyes desire, I kept not from, I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of my labor. Verses 11, then, I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and all the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. There was no profit under the sun. It was useless. I'd done it all. This is something he discovers with his wisdom with him, but it's not enough to teach him that. But he gets to the end and realized all of this was vexation of spirit. Is he saying that it's wrong to build wealth? No, he's saying that all of this stuff is useless if there's no wisdom to align you to divine purpose. That's what he's saying. Now, I find a man meeting Solomon, building wealth on that journey, and he's learning from Solomon how to build wealth, and that's important for that man. Listen, this is important. I find a young man who in the time when Solomon is trying to build gold and silver and to get gold and silver, building all his wealth and the precious treasures of kings, he is learning from Solomon. He's inspired by Solomon. Yet this is what Solomon finds in the end as vexation of spirit and vanity because it carries no purpose. That means even though I'm teaching this young man how to build wealth, I must also teach him the end of the matter that Solomon learns that it's vexation of spirit and vanity if it carries no purpose. Did you get it? Did you get it? So, when you get to that place of understanding, then we have to seek wisdom. Wisdom. Divine wisdom. When that comes to you, and then you add your artificial intelligence, your augmented realities, your quantum computing, your robotics, the internet of things, big data, and you bring it all together. Something so beautiful comes out of you. So beautiful. Because it is reconciled to your maker's purpose. The reason why you are on this earth, why you are existing on this earth. Praise the Lord Jesus. A few more things and I'll finish. Only because of time, but I have a lot to say. Pray for me. <laughs> so you study Solomon, and you start to see these aspects, and every aspect I want to touch shortly comes firstly from divine wisdom. Then it's expressed in the world of men as we see it, and you will realize that almost all the principles that we know govern wealth and how it's built and preserved you'll see that the Bible has spoken about these things. Actually, the, the, the world is just discovering them. For us, these are very old, ancient wisdom. 
It's like recently when I was studying this Chinese, they brought this thing called naive meritocracy. How many of you have heard of naive meritocracy? Put up your hand if you have. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, naive meritocracy is the thought that they've discovered, and some of you have seen it in life, that there are people who quite don't fit the equation of success because either they don't have the mental acuity, they don't have the qualifications, they don't have the connections and networks that would qualify them to be as successful as they are. So if you thought that everybody is a success because of some merit, we've discovered that there are individuals in life who are a success, but you can't explain the merit that takes them there because some of the means that take them to that place are orthodox. They are not necessarily wrong, but they seem to explain a hand that is beyond your science. You find a guy who didn't go to school, he can't even write his name in words, but he's a millionaire in dollars. So you, you ask yourself, how about this one? How is he a millionaire in dollars? I remember in, back in my banking days, there's this guy I used to write, I had to write for him the amount in words when he was withdrawing money because he didn't go to school. But he was one of the richest people in the bank. So if you're talking about education, this guy can't explain a simple income statement, a balance sheet. That's, that's for Vusi and me who went to school. You understand? But he can't explain it. But he's a success. So how does he make it? How is he a wealthy fellow? He's hiring professionals who have master's degrees on their head. He's their boss. They can't run what he's running. Even if they quit and went the next day to the next shop and started what he's doing, they can't do it. But they can work under him. Because there's something on him that our economics can't explain. And, and, and Solomon had seen it in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6. He said, go to the ant, you sluggard. Now he's talking to a sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. He's saying you can actually build wisdom by studying an ant. How can I explain that to a student of Harvard Business School? <laughs> that, that an ant can actually teach you how to build wealth. But it's true. Not all of us are going to build wealth the other way. Some of us are going to study this ant. You get it? And it says, they have no guide, no overseer, or rule. But the Bible says there is no how to provide their meat in the summer and gather their food in the harvest. He says, how long will you sleep or all sluggard? When you rise out of thy, will, will you rise out of thy sleep? This is not just physical sleep. This is spiritual. But some of us are spiritual eyes, our spiritual intellect, our spiritual ears are shut from the wisdoms that could have actually positioned us in some of the greatest successes of life because sometimes we are short-sighted. We only deduce life from what can be hypothetically explain and asserted. And he says, a little sleep and a little slumber, the folding of hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. And again, I repeat, this is not physical sleep because I know men who sleep very long, but they're wealthy. And I know men who don't sleep and they're poor. In my earlier years of work, before I joined the bank, I used to wake up at 2 a.m. and take goods in one of our central business district. By 2 a.m. were offloading goods up to 6 a.m. while the world was sleeping. But the guys who used to carry these goods to the store every morning were the poorest people. You get it? They were the poorest people. And the boss who used to send us at that particular point was asleep. So it's not physical sleep. <laughs> is spiritual. There are realities I have learned 
that you're just awakened to, there's a certain understanding and I've seen it has hit every wealthy person I know. Or at least if they don't have it, that money is only for a period. They'll lose it in a short while. But every time I've, I've, I've met very wealthy people and you sit down with them and they speak to you, you pick that wisdom. It's there. How many of you understand that? It's there. Some are not necessarily Christian. One of my mentors is an Indian man. He's not a Christian. But every time this man speaks, I pick wisdom from him that I know it's divine. It's not from a book. But every time he speaks things, he has the power to make things work. He can make a king out of nothing. And these people are sitting among us here. They're going to share lunch with you. Your next success perhaps could come from an aunt somewhere here. <laughs> are you following what I'm saying? Wealth can come even from the least expected places. He taught us about the power of preparation to die seat in the books. But for us who have studied the scriptures, it's an old thing. Proverbs 24 verses 27. Prepare thy work without and make it fit for, thy, for thyself in the field and afterward build your house. When you study the Hebrew there, he's talking about building a home, getting married. He's telling this young man, before you get married, there are things you must do. But also, it could also mean here, house this business. He says, prepare thy work without, make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thy house. That there are certain entities that are built after a certain pattern of preparation. And some of these preparations in, in part sort of make your business effortless, you know, because you have learned principles. It's like, let me give us a simple example. I was sharing with somebody last night on, in, on, 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 uh, on the table. From where I come from in Africa, we don't appreciate modern management. Everything is traditional. You understand what I'm saying? So I've seen men enter glories that they're not prepared for because they don't have the systems to support what they're building. This body of mine is a structure and it has a system, right? Go to the dream gym and build this muscle. But if you go to an attack on that nervous system, it doesn't matter how much muscle you have, you're, you're gone. That's what I'm trying to tell us here. That I've seen people, especially in our parts of the world, who have built very wonderful structures, but without systems that can prepare them. And I've realized this over the years as, as I've walked this journey, that systems are preparation. Systems are preparation. The spirit of preparation works through systems that really work. That's why these people come here to empower us. You take that lightly, but the Bible has spoken this for so many years. Diligence. Proverbs 22 verses 29, seest thou a man diligent in his work? The Bible says, that man shall stand before kings and not before mean men. That means the diligent spirit on you will attract a certain kind of people in your life. Just be diligent. You'll attract a certain kind of people. You get it? How do you enter a room and you just catch the attention of a certain individual? You get it? Because there's a diligent spirit on your life. Now, Christian, it doesn't matter how many books you get here. If you have not cultivated the spirit of diligence, you'll attract the meanest men on earth. Some of you, everybody around you is going to kill you, is planning to kill you, is either planning to take something from you, they are advantageous, I'm sorry, they're taking advantage of you, they're manipulating you. There's just something, and, and you're thinking, and I've seen these people come to me and like, Pastor, I don't know, pray for me. I have a spirit of rejection. I said, what do you mean? Everyone around me is robbing me, taking advantage of me, backbiting me, blackmailing me. My boss hates me. And I want to tell this woman, no, you actually don't have a spirit of rejection. You're just not diligent in spirit. If you knew how to cultivate that diligence in your spirit, there's a certain kind of people you'll attract. And many of you know this. Some of you have experienced this. I cannot tell you how many times I've entered certain places and I've caught the eye of those that matter. I was not the most articulate. 
as not the most expressive. I perhaps, maybe, the person came in the room even before I spoke or finished my sentence. No, sorry, after I'd finished my sentence. But those last lines, and somebody wants to make you your, their friend. They want to know who you are. They'll trade anything to give you their own time because they've seen something on your life they have no language for because the world of men can't explain it. But the world of the spirit explains it. This is a diligent person. Exercise some diligence on your spirit. And diligence is defined by disciplining the self. Disciplining the self. Taming yourself to some sort of discipline. Even to manage these little small things called time. Time, just to manage your time. I tell people for the last 15 or so years of my life, I study every six, almost six hours a day. This is something I live every day. That's just how I, and I, my God, you're going to take me in quantum physics, you'll find I know something. I don't know everything, but I'm learning. Some I forget. Some stay, you understand? But at the end of the day, I've, I cannot tell you how many opportunities have come to my table because one time I woke up at 2 a.m. to study something. You get it? That's why you should invest in these conferences that add to you. Now, he was speaking about mushrooms. I'm going to go back and read about this thing you're talking about. I'm not leaving it here. You get my point. I'm not leaving it here. I'm going to go and study how to smell, how, how, how you can smell. <laughs> I'm going to read about it. I'm going to read about it. Time thing, right? The way he's looking at me. Oh, don't worry, I'm going to finish. But I came far. 7,000 miles. 30 minutes. I'm almost finishing. I, are you seeing what I'm saying? Know everything. Invest in some things, but know everything. Study. You know, we live in a world, the other day I was dealing with one of my stuff. In Fanero, we have more than three, no, more than 8,000 volunteers and staff, 607 branches. That's how big. And everything is managed. On a Thursday, when we're doing 15,000 members seated there, you have 607 branches streaming live. Some are 3,000, 2,000, some are 200, smaller, some are 5,000. And everything is managed centrally. Nothing is broken. On 31st, we had more than 120,000 people. But we knew where everyone sat, where, who's, which toilet they were going to use, how they were going to park. Everything is planned by something. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's a lot to even think how we do it. I can't imagine, because in my own mind, I see that there's many brains that come together to build this. I remember the times I would go at night before the services next day, and I make sure that every chair is in the right line. Because I want a picture. If you, if you draw the video, I want a picture that I would show a straight line from here to the back. Some of them think, what's the big deal about it? It's a big deal. <laughs> if it finds an organized brain, if it, listen, because it's part of diligence. You might think it's a simple thing. You'll play a small video, put the, 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 the sound off. But when it finds an organized brain, just that little straight line alone introduces me right to a certain individual. And I cannot tell you how many times I used to go back and make sure that they're straight. No, you're a perfectionist. No, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm diligent. You understand what I'm saying? Because if I lose just three centimeters out of that, somebody's going to lose a seat. Because we are parked. I must maximize all the space that I need. I wish that was 31st. We used three fields. But there's one you'll see. I must maximize. How many people are those? Those were 80,000. That was the year before. But even to make that line to make sure that it's there. Did he pass it? Huh? But you saw that area of you? I wish you could re re reverse that and pause. You saw that area of you? Now, it's those little small things. If service, if they say service begins at five. Thank you. You see these lines? 
I cannot tell you how many nights I would go and tell this person, push this chair here. You get it? But anybody with an oriented mind would see me differently just by getting the right lines there. It's little small things, but they can change your life and your business. When I walk into, when somebody walks into my business, what's the first impression they see when they come in? You can call it branding, identity, and stuff like that. You, you have your size. But it's a certain diligence to make sure that I maintain a certain identity every time somebody walks into that meeting. Little small things, but they introduce me right. They announce me why it matters. They announce me. I've done the same in my businesses. I've done the same in every aspect of life. If somebody's doing business with me and we are meeting at 10, it is 10 a.m. It's, it's not 11, it's not 11, two past three, it, it is me. If I tell you I'm delivering on Thursday, I will deliver on Thursday. If I fail to deliver on Thursday, I'll make sure I've explained to you by Wednesday. So I appreciate why I can't make it on a Thursday. I'm not perfect, but I'm saying I'm adjusting every day. Every time I do this, I find myself before kings. I find myself in meetings discussing, if I can just tell you the things we've just signed a few weeks ago. I, I even shudder to say, because some of you, you you're rumor mongers. You, you got, you're, in Africa, news travels fast. It can land me in trouble. You understand what I'm saying? One time we did an advertisement and one of the biggest mobile network companies in the country came looking for me. How did you do this? We were just advertising a conference. You understand? One of, they came, how did you make this advertisement? Because we, we took time to get it right. I was standing before Kings explaining to them, no, you just got a bunch of guys. We, you understand what I'm saying? So why are we investing so much and we can't get this? Yet your boys can get together and do this. So out of that, some of the boys that I've, I worked with on that are now working for some advertising agencies, making money. You understand? Diligence. Proverbs 18, verses 9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. Some of you waste in the spirit. So you are wasting in the spirit, but you think that you're just going to wake up and go into that business as a success. But in the spirit realm, you're wasting a lot. That's what I was trying to say, that you can stand before wisdom and the, the, next, the next blessing on your life is just on the next speaker, but you might waste it. Treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish man wastes it. I pray every time and I say, if I stand before a man speaking, I pray everything that is ordained for my purpose and destiny, I don't miss even one of them. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I have so much to say, but I'm tired of speaking. <laughs> okay, one last one. Proverbs 21 verses 5. One last one. Give me the New Living Translation. New Living Translation. Do you have it or you don't? Diligence. <laughs> Diligence. Come on, let's clap for them. One, two, three, let's go. lead prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Give me the NIV. Give me the NIV. Eh? NIV, do you have it? Diligence. Okay, give me KJV. <laughs> give me KJV if that's what you have. What do you have? Aha, uh -huh, let's read. One, two, let's go. The thoughts of the diligent only, oh, don't get me preaching. Only tend to what? Plenteousness. But of everyone that is hasty, only to want. Anybody that is in need and is always wanting. See a man who is borrowing always and is always begging. I'll tell you a man who is not diligent. Verse 6. Let's read. Let's continue on that. 
Come on. Verse 6. Uh -huh. Verse 6. Press the arrow below. <laughs> Proverbs 21. You were on verse 5. Uh -huh. Press Press the arrow looking down. Proverbs 21, verses 5. Now we're going on verses 6. Press the down arrow. No, go back. You've gone in sec. Jesus. No, not that one. Proverbs 21, verses 5. First go to verses 5. Click verses 5. 21, verses 5. Are you there? Uh -huh. Now, click the arrow below. Uh -huh. <laughs> Come on, let's clap. <laughs> okay. Okay. Two verses to go. Uh -huh. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a word, vanity. Tossed to and fro of them that seek. Hey. I will not explain it. Some people are already guilty. Verse 7. The robbery of the wicked shall destroy them because they refuse to do judgment. That's why I tell the few people I do business with, I tell them, let me earn very little. But let it be true. Mm. Let me add, because the end of any robbery is death. It will kill something because you lack judgment. And judgment is the fruit of this wisdom I'm giving you today. So in everything that we're going to receive tonight, may we pray by God that above all will be established in the wisdom of God that aligns us to the purpose for which we were sent on the earth to fulfill. And that every force of law that is necessary to attract everything you need to align you to that purpose is availed for you foundationally through that wisdom. So that everything we add through everybody teaching begins from the wisdom that we receive by God. Have I made some sense? So, give me permission to pray with you, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you. The Bible says the entrance of your word brings light and giveth understanding to the simple. The Bible says this word is life to them that find it and it's health to all their bones, all their flesh. I pray for every man and woman and child at the sound of my voice as we build wealth, as we align ourselves to the successes, the concept of the Kickstarter conference and all these things it's bringing out of us, I pray by God that we walk in the wisdom for which you designed us, touching the purpose that you sent us on this earth for, that will live bigger and greater than just having a wonderful meal and driving expensive cars and living in an expensive, expensive mansion, but that will really touch this world and leave marks, indelible marks, that will echo through eternity. I also pray for every person at the sound of my voice, may the earth yield forth its substance to you. May kings come to your rising. May Gentiles come to your light. May strangers serve you. May you be blessed going in and going out. Blessed in the city as you are blessed in the country. I decree and I declare in the name of Jesus Christ that the best years are ahead of you. The worst has already happened. God is going to position people before you to advantage and add on you and not to take away. The wicked and unreasonable are going to be far away from you. You're going to separate just success from blessing. The blessing of God goes before you. That which he gave Abraham and he was wealthy. He gave Solomon, Isaac, and Jacob and they were wealthy. Even so shall you walk in that blessing as God will establish the covenant he made with your forefathers even before you came on the earth. May this earth bring all the hidden and secret treasures that are under the earth which are free and may you by all means access them free. Not because you won't spend but that as you, even when you spend, it won't be your source in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you, thank you. Oh my God. Uh, I don't know where even to start from.
But I want to thank you so much, Papa. This is just, I told you today you are in for a surprise. This is just a start. It is just a start. Thank you, thank you, thank you. People from 10 countries are here to kickstart their concerts. Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Toronto, Toronto. India, UK. That's why you should invest in these conferences that add to you. The impact of the concept is going around the world. This is just amazing. Arizona, Texas, California, Texas, New Jersey, Virginia, Illinois, North Carolina, Indiana, Pennsylvania, business, real estate and innovation. Brian is the real thing and the new kid on the block. We got to buy the first house this year. Concept Kickstarter Conference 2024. The Concept Kickstarter 2024. The Concept Kickstarter Conference Concept Kickstarter. We actually coming from DMV area from Maryland. Yes. This is what we call the concept Kickstarter. So when you ask me a question like, how do I understand the word concept Kickstarter? First thing I want to say to you is, it's easy to start. It's a lot harder to stay. 